1984, I did my HSC. I actually did, uh, I've always been an absolute film obsessive and nut. I did a Super 8 film for my um, HSC work and an animated booklet. Um, and the teachers I had back then, uh, Jane Brown and Bill George, uh, there was a group of us in our class, six of us from the same class got into Kofa that year, which was quite extraordinary. So basically, my going to Kofa was like continuing uh, high school straight into the, the next period. And um, it was interesting back then, I don't know what it's like now and what you focus on now, but for some reason then our teachers, we, I, I loved architecture as a kid, and we had a very strong architecture component to what we did in high school. Like my, my strongest memories really of learning about Frank Lloyd Wright, Le Corbusier, um, Miles van der Rohe, all that sort of modernist period architecture, a lot of classical architecture as well. But we also focused heavily on pop art back then, which is and surrealism, which I guess for younger kids is something very easy to get a handle on and get a hook on. And it's very visual and you can really get into it and get your teeth into it. And um, that's heavily influenced my work. My work's very pop based. There's a lot of pop imagery. It, it, it grabs from popular culture, it grabs from advertising, it grabs from film. Um, when I went to Kofa, my interview to get into Kofa, all I discussed was film, was the people I loved at the time. I loved people like Ridley Scott and Stanley Kubrick and Martin Scorsese. I don't remember even mentioning an artist or a sculptor or anyone. So I essentially got in, it's, uh, once again, because it's 30 years on, everything's changed, but I got in to study film and I majored in film. I failed every other art class I did. I failed my painting classes, my sculpture classes, I failed all my um, research classes, but I love film. We were doing 16 mil back then. It was on the cusp of the video sort of revolution. So um, it was an interesting time to be there because now it's obviously all digital, completely different. So essentially I went to art school, studied film, failed, left, came out, was a bit of a bum for years, did a lot of set building, um, which feeds into exactly what the work you're about to see. So for a number of years I had a, an uncle who took me under his wing and said, James, you need a bit of direction. You can't sort of sit in the pub for the rest of your life. So he got me a job down at the Sydney Theatre Company, um, building sets and props, um, which I loved back in the late 80s. And then that continued on all through the 90s. I worked for the Sydney Dance Company, Sydney Theatre Company. Any shows that were on in the 90s for the Sydney Dance Company, I would have built the sets or props for or been involved with. Um, but it was a great training ground because I learned all my skills. Um, I was always handy and I was always an obsessive Lego builder you know, an obsessive Meccano builder, you know, mud, if there was mud around, there'd be something built in the mud, or if there was a tree with sticks, there'd be something built with sticks. So I always had it in me, but getting into that background and having somebody sort of teach me the ropes and show me how to use tools really, um, uh, well, it just, I used, I've just finished building a house in, in Annandale, um, and all the skills that I learned set building have gone into that, they go into my practice. Um, but fundamentally, late 90s, I had an, an old friend of mine who was a painter from school. Um, once again, set building, great creative outlet, but not necessarily what I'd wanted to be doing with my life. Um, there's always that niggling, I, I, you know, I should be doing art. I studied art. My father was quite a well-known artist from the 60s and 70s, Peter Powditch. Um, so art's always been, you know, part of the family. And um, a friend of mine, we were in the pub once again. He was a very good painter, but he'd gone off and become an um, industrial design. He'd gone and done an industrial design course because he thought he needed to make a living, as we both did. And uh, we're sitting there lamenting that we weren't doing what we wanted. And we said, look, we should really just do a show. You know, we should do something with the you know, with our, you know, skills other than... He was designing cardboard boxes, right? So that's where his level of creativity had gone to, packaging. So, um, and we booked a gallery at Tap Gallery. I don't know what your schools... Are you in, in West or inner city or... Tap Gallery's been going for yonks. So it's an artist-run space down in um, Darlinghurst, run by a mad lady called Liz Leslie Dimmick. Open door policy, they'll accept any proposal. You don't have to... A lot of the, the artist-run spaces, often you need to give a pro proposal and they'll have to, you know, OK, it has to fit within the, the bubble of what they like to show. Tap is just absolute, complete open slather. And we um, had our first show there in 97. So I came, in a sense, I came, I had my first show when I was 31. I'm 47 now, so basically, I, you know, I, I came to my art career relatively late. So um, that's sort of just a little bit of background on how we got, we had our first show, it did reasonably well. We got a reviewer at the time who worked for the Herald, came along, wrote a little piece on it. That was enough to keep, you know, get us interested to keep going. 